This is Vin Armani of Cointext and Counter Markets, and you're listening to Milk from Coinspice. Coinspice.io. With C. Edward Kelso from Coinbase. Huge Spice. fan. Let's just start there. I've uh, been following your um, oh, career you. really since I think you came on in my orbit with Symbiant, and then yeah. we travel in some some pretty similar uh, philosophical circles. We have a um, <clears throat> um, um, shared interest in the Mises Institute and things awesome. Austrian and so on. And so I, I kind of heard of you, and then all of a sudden you went all in crypto, and I got the backstory, a little bit of the backstory, but you actually come from Wall Street, is, is, is that correct? Yeah, it's funny. Um, uh, from the outsider's perspective, I suddenly went all in crypto, but I right. <laughs> was pretty much all in crypto for a few years there while I was still working on Wall Street and just keeping my head down. And, and uh, but, you know, I was doing a lot of really meaningful important work helping pensioners ensure that they get their pensions paid and didn't want to walk away from that and uh and around around about that time was when i discovered all I, I crypto i discovered it in 2012 mm -hmm. just to put some puzzle pieces together since you asked the question this way i was 2012 is when we did our first big pension de-risking transaction for general motors and that was followed up very shortly thereafter by verizon um, and, and so I discovered Bitcoin, didn't have time to dig into it, had the same skepticism that most people did, um, but then really started getting into it in 2013, in part because of some things I started seeing in these, in these pension deals that made me really uncomfortable with how the existing system worked. And when you look under the hood of the existing system, you realize it's just not stable and not fair. And uh, it, it you know, didn't take me too long to dig in um, and, and, and realized that Bitcoin would solve a lot of those problems. But of course, you know, I was still working on pension transactions at Morgan Stanley, so kept my head down. And very few people knew, um, like uh, Jonathan Mohan knew, um, Ari Levy Cohen knew, Trace Mayer knew, um, Jake Dienelt, uh, rest, rest in peace, Jake, uh, he also knew introduced me to a lot of people, but everybody agreed, like, keep my identity secret while I was at Bitcoin meetups. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, there was a sense of bursting on the scene, but in fact, actually, a lot of folks knew beforehand. Wow. That is crazy. And did you, when you were at, so when, when you were at Morgan, you were actually kind of delving into, into crypto. Did you do anything overtly with crypto while at Morgan or? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and this is all public information, so I'm not breaking any confidences here. <laughs> I kept my head down in the early years, but then there was a group of us that started to, um, you know, form a, a email group at Morgan Stanley. This would have been late 2013, early 2014, and right about that time um, is when Ripple came in. I met Ripple in January 2014, and that was the one, that meeting connected the dots for me that that we may actually see interest from the mainstream industry in applying blockchain, not necessarily Bitcoin. And at the time they were pitching their payment rails, not XRP. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so um, I, I ended up uh, getting permission to d give a teach in to the fortune 20 corporate treasurers on Bitcoin in May, 2014. And that was funny because that all that had to go all the way up to the head of compliance because it's, uh, to my knowledge, it was the first time that anything with the word Bitcoin went out with the Morgan Stanley logo on it. Uh, and of course it wasn't publicly shared. It was, this was kept very private and very narrowly distributed just to these corporate treasurers. And I, I think right now listeners, if, if you know, they're, they, they might not have a sense because there's so much talk about, I mean, now we're full on to uh, Wall Streetization, which which we'll, we'll we'll get into. But back when you're you're speaking of Bitcoin was the or crypto was sort of the the, the coin of the realm for terrorists, for drug dealers, for yep. all sorts of 
you know, horrible and, and, and awful people in, in, in terms of the mainstream um, conception of it. So this was, this was a pretty bold move. Now, how do you, how do you, how do you, because you eventually leave Wall Street, so how, how does that happen? Well, um, it, it's funny, it, it was just a stepwise process. The, at some point along the way, it was 2014, the chief technology officer of Morgan Stanley called me because he saw me participating on the email channel, you know, and you wouldn't be surprised to hear the email channel turned, it, it was hundreds of people from all over the world, very global, generally very junior because there is a generational aspect to this no question and so sure. i stuck out like a sore thumb because i've got some of the proverbial gray hair and it was running a business as a managing director so he called me and and said you know come on in what the heck is this thing he'd been of course watching it himself as well but he wanted to understand how somebody who was connected to the community was thinking about it and so you know once that happened i knew i had cover to to be out so to speak and then yeah, i started doing teachings um for uh, folks internally at morgan stanley as well as for customers clients wanted to hear about it so they would all take meetings because there was something new they needed to learn about and so it was a gradual process um and uh and ultimately i met mark smith in and patrick byrne from overstock at about the same time in june of 2014 and the three of us started working quietly behind the scenes on, on ideas. Mark ended up with um, Adam Krellenstein and the counterparty guys going to Overstock for a while. Um, and then they, they went their separate ways. I ended up staying friends with both of them uh, and joining Mark. And uh, then Mark and I've gone our separate ways. But, uh, you know, obviously the, the three of us who originally came together in June 2014 have, all, have gone all in on on, on, frankly, on applying blockchain technology to fix Wall Street problems. All three of us are, are working in different ways to advance that cause. Hmm. That's that, yeah, you can kind of, <clears throat> as you're talking, I'm kind of seeing this branch, you know, and I hear all these names and now they're, <clears throat> they're major players. Um, but it's interesting to, to think of them back then as, as, as kind of just, you know, toe dipping and uh, pioneers in terms of the, uh, the, the, the Wall Street experience. Um, let, let me pause real quick here in, in, in the narrative and because I, <clears throat> I want to get your take on it. We're, we're speaking during, I, I don't want to put too much stink on this, but um, <laughs> in, in our, uh, we're, uh, at CoinSpice, we're, we're very much um, partisan to uh, Bitcoin Cash. Now that's not, we don't completely go all in, but we, we sort of favor it and we're part of that community that, that's, I guess, sub-niche. And of course, right now happening is the, is the, um, or within a few minutes anyway, the, the hard fork, the contentious hard fork, right. the cash war. You're, <clears throat> you're an interesting person to get a perspective on that because from what I can get of you, you're not really a partisan so much as you are pro crypto. And yep. you really, I, I know you really like um, Bitcoin BTC, <clears throat> but, um, I've never heard you speak ill of, of really any of it. Um, what are from? Um, you're not an outsider, but for someone who's not, say, as uh, as parochial as I am, um, what, what <laughs> especially from the institutional side, okay? Um, what what are you guys making of of this uh, Bitcoin Cash um, um, uh, hash war? Well, I, I don't have a particular view on, on the two sides. I generally, as you say, stay out of it because mm -hmm. I support all of the experimentation. And I think the ad hominem attacks that can happen are mm -hmm. very unfortunate. But I, I, I've, I, I've kept good relationships with both sides in part because both sides have the right to exist. And, and when I say both yeah. sides, I'm talking about the old the original fork between um, okay. BTC and BCH, but mm -hmm. even the two, the new fork that's coming up that's contentious, both sides have the right to exist. I have a Mingerian view of money, which is broader than a Misesian view of money, which is, mm -hmm. uh, which basically says, you know, let the best one win and let them all compete. And there are ideas that are really powerful in all of these different versions of cryptocurrencies and I don't know which one is ultimately going to succeed. You've probably heard me say, I think Bitcoin's network effects are going to be very, very difficult to replicate 
But that doesn't mean that Bitcoin 20 years from now will look like Bitcoin today. It could right. end up uh, looking more like Bitcoin Cash. We don't know how it's going to evolve. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a developer, so I don't, I'm not qualified to um, get into the weeds on the debates. I definitely have views about you know, the, the energy use and, and the like. Um, mm -hmm. um, so definitely not complete newbie at it, but uh, I don't consider myself qualified to argue on the details of the technology. So I'll leave that to those who are. And I guess lastly, I would say for those of your listeners who are bummed about the contentious nature, this is normal. Um, most of these governance fights play out behind closed doors in corporate boardrooms. And they are every bit as nasty as the fights that are playing out in public. Mm. So I don't think that for a minute that there's something different and somehow worse about these governance models. The only difference is that they're playing out in public. Mm. That's, that's really, really interesting. Um, I think, you know, we, we all need some perspective on this and <clears throat> I uh, am officially on record as being horrible at predicting anything. So um, I was the guy uh, during the, uh, the, the Trump ascendancy that li literally as he's at the hotel that evening, you know, Mr. President elect, I was the guy still adding up uh, electoral votes going this is this is not happening ah. so um, <laughs> I'm terrible terrible at predicting things but I do believe this Bitcoin changes today and you know a lot of the talk about 51% attacks and some of the nitty-gritty about um, the inside baseball with regard to uh, um, centralization and so on mm -hmm. it, th there seems to be something like that happening and I wonder, I wonder what comes next it's because we saw, <clears throat> again, it's hard to know correlation causation, but we saw the price of, uh, of Bitcoin uh, BTC um, just plummet yesterday. The and, entire crypto sphere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> and I, I don't think that's a coincidence. It could be. Yeah. But um, I think maybe the market's starting to catch up with, what some of us insiders were seeing, which is, uh, this has got a bunch of bad juju all over it, but that's, that's not the way you see it. Yeah. You're, you're seeing it as a, as a, as a, as a, as kind of a healthy fight. Yeah. See, and I also think price is the most, is the least interesting aspect of this market. I love the fact that we're in crypto winter right now and it, mm. you know, it pretty much applies to every, every cryptocurrency because this is when you get a real shake out of, what's going to work and what's not. We're getting a natural weeding out. You know, it's a re it's, in a way, it's a recession, right? You, 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 you and I talked at the beginning about crossing paths through the Mises Institute. Right. The, the difference um, in the crypto sphere is that it's a true free market. And so we will have recessions, small r recessions. We're allowing them to occur. Right. And this is one. And uh, it, is, it, it is a natural part of the Bus the unconstrained free market business cycle that we can get flushed out and that we will have some businesses that don't survive. And this is, this is the, the healthy creative destruction of capitalism. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure which way this is all going to go. And I'm not a trader as well. So I'm not, you know, again, mm -hmm. in the weeds, but certainly given what, what happened yesterday, it does seem like there's, there's an interesting coincidence. I think, uh, you know, a lot of people, because the forks have been historically so profitable, mm -hmm. may have actually been selling other crypto to go into BCH. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, um, you know, this may be temporary. But uh, I, I will say the other thing that I, I look at all this and see all these Wall Street players coming in, like Bact and Citigroup and right. Truex, right? And, and I think to myself, this is what the Wall Street firms are now going to have to deal with. And there's going to be open litigation, mm -hmm. I think, on these Wall Street versions of these crypto products because, um, you know, it was it, it, not everyone, not everyone's going to have the same view. It was funny. I was looking at one of the exchanges um, announcements about uh, suspending BCH and given uh -huh. the nature of the fork. You know, they were going to suspend it for one hour originally. This is one of the big exchanges. And then they, came, they amended what they said they were going to do and say they were not committing to a time when they were going to be back up online. And I don't know, they, they may have changed it even since. But it just goes to show you, like, you know, if you've got a contractual obligation in an SEC-registered product or a CFTC-regulated 
mm -hmm. you know, futures contract, what exactly are you buying? Um, and and it, it, basically, there are going to be a lot of people who are not going to be like the crypto sphere. Uh, we've been generally caveat emptor, right? If we lost money because we got screwed or some exchange got hacked, you know, the OK, I'm thinking about the OKEX situation where there was a uh -huh. bail in, right? Uh -huh. I don't, I don't think there was litigation over that because our, even in Mount Gox, right? Most people just kind of, I, I looked at my, my losses in Mount Gox as tuition. It taught me an important lesson and I moved sure. on with, and that lesson of course is not your keys, not your Bitcoin. Yep. And, I, and I lost Bitcoin in Mount Gox. A lot of us did. And um, to me, that was, I like Charlie Schrem's um, uh, statement where you've got to lose money in crypto to make before you make it. He's right. You, you've got to learn those important lessons yourself, mm. right? And, um, and, and uh, this is going to be crazy when Wall Street has to face something like this. And, and <laughs> what if this was in a Wall Street version product where you're going to, you know, start to see high priced lawyers get involved with litigation as opposed to what we're seeing now, which is the outright fight, you know, in the Twitter sphere. Yes. I think the Twitter sphere fight is healthier. <laughs> it, uh, that's such an interesting perspective. There's so many ways to go, but it's a perfect uh, actual transition into, uh, I think, more in your wheelhouse, <clears throat> which is the Wall Streetization, uh, which, which I, I think you feel, and I'm putting words in your mouth now, kind of leading the witness, is inevitable in, in some yes. sense and backed, backed really, I mean, for, for those of us who, who don't travel in, in sort of the institutional uh, legacy circles, um, I, I had not heard of ICE, believe it or not. <clears throat> and so I had to kind of look it up and I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, this, this is a big this area. Is literally yeah. a big, too, too big to fail. It, it, is, it is core market infrastructure in U.S. capital markets, definitely. And, yeah. and, and you know, and, just, just to be silly to give you kind of how I knew it was a big deal is Fortune Magazine ran a 5,000-word in-depth, colorful narrative piece on – the potential rollout of backed down yeah. to down to the characters involved. I was like, uh Oh, someone's paying attention to this. And then when you took up the cause, um, uh, Caitlin uh, writes a um, uh, mandatory, mandatory reading column uh, for Forbes. Um, if you're not reading it, you're, um, you're losing, losing money and you're, 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 you know, illiterate for it. Um, oh, thank you. you. No, that's not the case. <laughs> I'm contributing to the knowledge base. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. But 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 let's say let, let's take up back. Um, you you I mean it's it's probably way too in depth to get into, you know, completely. But but kind of give us the broad strokes of your is someone who was in Wall Street now is in all in on crypto, and you still kind of have feelers in both. Um, what what does back to mean for us? Do you think? Well, it's the the hybridization of these two settlement systems. The traditional settlement system is a delayed net settlement system that uses intermediaries and where everything is owned indirectly through those intermediaries. The crypto settlement system, as your list, listeners know, is where assets are issued, traded, and settled directly on a blockchain. There is no such thing as indirect ownership. Everything is uh, the buyer and settle are exchanging assets in near real time. There's no delay in settlement. Um, and you don't have inter intermediaries unless you want to inject an exchange, um, in which case you don't really own your coins anymore. What you own is, a, is an IOU from them. But if you're owning your coins directly and you're trading directly with peer-to-peer -peer trading, it, it, it's very different than the existing settlement system. So what I've just described to you is two settlement systems that are, I would argue, in many ways, fundamentally incompatible. And now what's going to happen is we're going to try to hybridize them. And, in, and some of your listeners are probably saying, well, wait a minute, we've had hybrids around for a while. Tether um, is a hybrid. Yes, right. it is. Um, and same, same with, um, with LedgerX. They've been, they were the first um, regulated um, uh, Bitcoin derivatives platform, and they've been around for a while. Uh, and, and they haven't had problems. Of course, Tether has, um, but both of them are hybrids, right? One, they're actually, I'm, I'm just writing a, a, a column for Forbes right now um, on this very topic of how to, how to think about these hybrids because they're inherently um, middle ground steps, right? We, we don't want to buy our Bitcoin directly. We want to be able to buy it through our stockbroker. So 
Um, right. Let's let's put Bitcoin in your 401k. Uh, by the way, that big that notion of Bitcoin in your 401k, of course, it's not real Bitcoin. As all of your listeners know, it's going to be a a Bitcoin IOU in your 401k, yep. and it's not likely to track the actual underlying spot Bitcoin. Um, and again, think of these forks that we're facing in Bitcoin Cash right now. Um, this this is going to create all kinds of volatility in the hybrid that's supposed to track the price of the Bitcoin, but it's not going to track the price of the Bitcoin very accurately when you get into times like this. And that's when you're going to get misallocation of or misunderstanding, that, you know, misaligned expectations and lawsuits, I think. Um, so it's it, this hybrid, the, the whole hybrid trend um, is inherently risky because you are combining two different settlement systems. And the Tether example is a perfect one where we have perfect transparency into Tether, but we have zero transparency into whether there's actually cash backing it. <laughs> um, and so, and that's precisely because there's no transparency into the dollar-based system. And therefore, we shouldn't expect to have perfect transparency when we, when we try to marry these two. Uh, I think um, when I said they were middle ground products, I was thinking back into the Andreas Antonopoulos phrase of walled gardens in the early days of bitcoin he taught me so much and this was one of the things he talked about that we had the intranets before we had internet um and that people just weren't comfortable with opening up their um their their platforms uh and so we went through these wall the walled garden stage i sort of see this hybrid stage as the walled garden stage with stable coins and bitcoin backed futures and um, you know, depository receipts and ETFs, they're hybrids. They're not the real mm -hmm. thing in either case. And, um, you know, they're going to be interesting, but they're going to be fraught with problems. And nobody should expect that you're actually owning your crypto because you're not. Just and, go in with eyes wide open. And it, it drives um, enthusiasts on our side um, bonkers <clears throat> because yeah. there's all this there's all this gymnastics, all this, all this jujitsu. And it just like, go download a damn wallet and trade with someone <laughs> like, like we don't need all, all the rest of it. But then, you know, the market and I'm not, when I, I, you know, little M, um, people for whatever reason, they, they may like uh, Coinbase is a great example. Um, arguably no institution is more responsible for onboarding people into crypto. But yet, yes. I mean, they're not. <laughs> they're yeah. they're basically a bank, and that's right. You, you could make you could make a, an argument that really violates the whole point of the you know the program in in the first place, and so it, it drives our guys bonkers when when we talk about this stuff. But I you know it, there there really does seem to be this inherent and I, i've been talking about it with, with a bunch of people um i know you're familiar with uh with uh, professor warbeck out at uh, wharton yes um, we were we went to law school together yeah yeah he, he yeah. mentioned you um in <laughs> uh, in a podcast uh, for his 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 latest book um his book is awesome yeah 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 and uh what a what a pro um we yeah, talked about awesome. it um quite a bit and he was just like look dude you know whether you like it or not, people want some kind of trust. They, you know, they, they, they want that third party um, and, and just sort of inherent. And, and we've seen it in this weird experiment that is cryptocurrency. And um, I swear I had a point in mentioning all this. But, um, oh, Gabriel. Well, just a, go, yeah, go Gabriel, ahead, good. Yeah. Well, uh, I, th I think your point was that, that people actually, some people just aren't going to go through the, the, all those hoops. To right. set up their own wallets, yeah. And Gabriel Cardona, who I just had on, who speaks just he's so awesome. About you. Yeah, he oh, is. we had such a great time at Wyo Hackathon. He was he was just he was just great. We had a great conversation, by the way, about the BTC BCH split yeah. at the time. Yeah, and he's he's so so good. I was yeah. so grateful to to him to be out to help the developers at Wyo Hackathon. Just, you guys have just been great to 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 support what we we're doing in Wyoming. He's, he's just a brilliant guy and he is talking about stable coins and he's, you know, maybe not a fan, but he said he really does believe that security tokens or stable coins or whatever you want to call them are kind of the next big thing. Uh, some sort of, uh, 
variation on that theme. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so, I, I actually but, do think security tokens are, actually, actually I agree with Gabriel's statements, um, that, that, that you're going to see regulated versions of stable coins. You already mm -hmm. have some pretty big names. I, I think the um, uh, uh, basis um, was the first regulated stable coin with big, you know, um, existing financial industry backers. It had Bain mm -hmm. and Lightspeed and Stanley Druckenmiller himself and Kevin Warsh, former Fed governor himself personally. Those guys backed basis in July. And when I saw that, I thought, oh, here come the regulated stable coins. And now a bunch of them have been introduced. And this is going to be increasing the ability for large value payments to settle in uh, real time with settlement finality, as opposed to going through the correspondent banking system where you're, you know, spending a fortune and uh, you, you've got counterparty risk and you're not getting settled, you know, real time settlement and, and settlement finality. So I think stable coins actually do have a, a potentially very important role to play on Wall Street. Um, mm -hmm. And then security tokens, I, security tokens to me are not a hybrid because I define a hybrid as anything that is, that, that combines the two settlement systems. A security token is a security that's issued directly on a blockchain. So there's no, com no combining the two settlement systems. It's not exactly. a hybrid. Mm -hmm. That I, I think is the killer app. And that's the one part of BACT's involvement in this space that I'm really optimistic about because I hope they pivot quickly to, um, they, they backed own is a sister company of the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, they, I hope they pivot quickly to security tokens because if we can get all the securities market on in, 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 in token form, I'm not talking about a tokenized security. I make I a big mm -hmm. distinction between a tokenized security and a security token. Security token is issued natively on a blockchain. A tokenized security just takes an existing Apple share and puts it in a, crypt a crypto wrapper. Exactly. So it's kind of like tokenizing a gold bar, right? <laughs> um, it's not issued natively on the blockchain, and so it's inherently a hybrid. But, but the security tokens I'm talking about are the hardcore natively issued tokens. That's the game changer. That's very interesting to me. And I, and I really hope that the engineers who, out there who are listening to this podcast really get you know get some breakthroughs pretty quickly on uh, in that um, area of the world there's some great projects underway i know bitcoin.com is working on some to try to get you know natively issued securities on blockchains and godspeed mm -hmm. to all of you can't have it fast enough in my view <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's that's where gabriel comes in and another nice transition and i think we'll we'll end here is your advocacy in Wyoming, and I made fun of you in a in a roundabout way because Gabriel and I were talking uh, about uh, he he brought it up about uh, his experiences in Wyoming. He said, "Shout out to Caitlin," da -da 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 -da. and then that started us on the whole jag of how great you are. And then I said, "Isn't it hilarious? Uh, hilarious and kind of my smug Southern California uh, beach lifestyle uh, thing here that." Of all the places in the world that the crypto revolution may <laughs> may take <laughs> off, Laramie, Wyoming was not was not on my radar. And he and he he kind of like stepped back. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. He's like, why not? Yeah, yeah exactly. He he was defending it. He was like, he was like, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. There's some really bright people there. And he starts going on about how everybody's moving there, and he talked about the Wyoming hackathon. Uh, what the hell is going on in Wyoming? <laughs> Well, we, we, there are some really bright people there, and it's amazing uh, that we are creating a, a, a crypto valley, if you will, um, in the Rockies. That whole front range, there's a lot going on in Denver, as you know. That whole front range of Denver up north all the way into southeastern Wyoming is becoming a, a crypto mecca. Wyoming by far has better laws, but I will say that, that Colorado just – elected a very crypto friendly governor it doesn't have a crypto friendly legislature so i'm hoping right. that you know that, that that they join wyoming although of course i'm uh, I'm, I'm pretty partial to wyoming but um it, it's to me it's not a surprise wyoming is a rugged individualist state that doesn't like to be told by the feds what the laws are in the state of wyoming and um it's it's uh, it also has tremendous building blocks 
the University of Wyoming was already independently getting into the blockchain teaching. And then, of course, Wyoming itself as a state invented the limited liability company in 1977. There's no corporate or income tax. There's no franchise tax. Um, it, it, so, so we've got this great, great group of building blocks. And I look at it and say, there's absolutely no reason why Wyoming can't grab this. Um, as Joe Lubin said at Wyoming Hackathon, there's no reason why the next Google is, it can't, can't be created here. The crypto industry, as you know, is so global and everybody's so connected. And there's not a single company where everybody has to be based in one place. Everybody's searching the globe for engineers with sp specific skill sets. Right. And so it's not unusual that you have people scattered, scattered all over the world. So why wouldn't you domicile your startup in Wyoming if you've got regulatory clarity and you're not paying any taxes? And that, and that is in large part due to some of your, your efforts. Um, I interviewed you in, a, in, a, in another capacity and you kind of shoved it off to, uh, to a few other people. But you and, and your group there in Wyoming have, have headed what you've, I guess, kind of called sort of the blockchain friendly um, uh, pieces of legislation, five or six pieces, as, as, as I recall. Yep. yep. And uh, it's, it's been so it's, it's been received well. And the the Wyoming uh, hackathon that you uh, that you organized there, uh, that also went well. Yeah, it, it was incredible. It had some of the who's who of the blockchain industry, Bitcoin.com included, as sponsors. And you guys sent people out. And, but it, it, it was specifically not one particular protocol. We had right. people building on all kinds of protocols. There were 27 teams that, com that competed. And I will say, we, we made it very developer-focused, a little advertisement in case we do it again next year, which I hope we will. This was a true developer's hackathon. We brought in COTS. We brought in an, a copious amount of, of hot food, and basically everybody, who's, including Gabriel, said um, this, this was a serious hackathon for developers because we set it up to make it really developer-friendly. You didn't have to leave the place, and frankly, you didn't want to. Um, and, uh, you know, it was great. Mar guys like Marshall Long were, you know, hanging out till 3 a.m., with the developers, I, I just, I couldn't have um, asked for a better outcome. And you had gubernatorial candidates there. Uh, you mentioned yeah. Joe Lubin from Consensus was there. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we had Eric Voorhees, um, Jeff Garzik, uh, and obviously Gabriel and uh, Marshall Long. Um, yeah, uh, and Patrick Byrne as well came out. Oh, it was, right, it, right, right. You know, among, among the luminaries. But there again, this was a developer focused conference so the nature of the developers we had we had senior engineers from google come out to participate in it so and it just brought people to wyoming that would never have otherwise gone and right. i think gabriel's experience is exactly right like there's something special happening there and we've got more bills coming in the legislature um two of which definitely have opposition this this time um and i'm not 100 percent sure we'll get them through I think they at least have a 50-50 chance, but one requires the Secretary of State to integrate with a blockchain. It doesn't tell them which one to integrate with, <laughs> but the impact of that is now we can start actually getting securities issued directly on a blockchain where the genesis moment, which is the, the formation of the business and registration at the Secretary of State, that genesis moment is captured on a blockchain. So now you actually have no break in the digital chain of information for the entire life cycle of the company. And you wow. can always verify that your shares were, were validly issued. And if Wyoming's the first state to offer that, we were hoping to be able to do that in Delaware, but they slowed way down and hired IBM and, you know, they're not focused on, on, on moving quickly and, and, uh, and, and doing, you know, big important changes, whereas Wyoming is. And so um, I'm, I'm hoping that that one goes through. And then, then another one is a, a crypto friendly bank. We've got big opposition from the banking industry on that one. Of course. Um, but, uh, you know, this is a, a consistent problem. Um, and this bank would be non FDIC insured, so it doesn't have the threat that of, of FDIC audits on Bank Secrecy Act, all that know your customer anti money laundering stuff. You still have to comply with those laws, but you don't have the FDIC breathing down your neck. So we're hoping that that, that helps. Re relieve the, um, the the problem of getting basic banking services for startups in the industry. That's that's incredible. And 
I, I could kind of see Wyoming becoming, <clears throat> I guess years ago, uh, Omaha, Nebraska was considered sort of the main hub, or you'll, you'll find these kind of out of the way for us, again, Southern Californians. Uh -huh. <clears throat> um, you know, you might as well be in uh, a Baghdad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you'll, you'll hear about these huge Fortune 500 companies uh, being, you know, um, headquartered in, in some, you know, out of the way, you know, Midwestern uh, place or, 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 or what have yep. you. And that just has to do with, with uh, as you just said, uh, regulatory uh, clarity. So uh, incredible, incredible work. So let's, uh, let's officially end on crystal ball looking forward. Um, Long-term, short-term bullish bearish on crypto. Well, I'm not going to make a price prediction because, no, no. like I said, I think it's the least interesting aspect. I am <laughs> all in bullish on crypto. This is a revolution, and we're going to be dismantling the, the inferior settlement system of the legacy financial industry. My guess is that this hybrid um, step is, is an intermediate step. We're going full crypto. It may take a couple decades. But all securities, all financial instruments, all cash, it's all going to be crypto on decentralized public open blockchains. That's my, that's my strong belief. And uh, let's all keep working towards it. Boom. Um, we've been talking with, uh, with, with Caitlin Long. Um, she's, of course, got a column out at Forbes. Um, she's on Twitter. Where, where, can they, where can they find you and, and follow you? It's at Caitlin, C-A-I-T-L-I-N, long, L-O-N-G, underscore. Yeah, do that. Get out there, follow her. Uh, I guarantee you, you will learn something. Uh, Caitlin, this has been a long time coming. You've been so generous with your time. I really, really appreciate it. Good luck with everything that you do. Thank you so much. Fun interview. Thanks. Take care.